Hi, folks. Welcome to everyone. My name is Kevin Petrie, VP of Research here at Eckerson Group, and your host for today. We designed CDO Tech Fence to compress the time that it takes data leaders and their teams to evaluate merging technologies, new tool sets, and also to learn best practices for putting those tools to work. So today our topic is how to create, govern, and manage data products. Before we begin, I want to quickly walk through what you can expect over the next few hours. CDO Tech Fence is a two hour and 45 minute virtual event we have a keynote, which will start shortly, practitioner Q&A, featured presentations, and also an expert panel. So we do want to recognize our sponsors, uh, our partners, who help make this event possible, Cogenity and Tamer, as well as our media partners. They help promote the event. Uh, this includes Dedicated, Blur Group, EM360 Solutions Review, Real-Time Insights, Datanami, and Bark. Thank you, one and all. So a little bit about Eckerson Group, uh, which is hosting this event. We're a boutique research consulting and advisory firm that focuses on data analytics. You've probably read our research, and that's probably why you're here, but you may not know that our consulting division also works with a number of clients, big and small, brand name and niche, in order to develop data strategies, modernize data architectures, and build data governance programs, among other things. So please contact us if you'd like to learn more about those services. We also wanna give you a sneak preview of our next event in March, which I'll be hosting, focused on da driving data management and analytics with generative AI. All right, so now I'm gonna hand over to our keynote speaker, Wayne Eckerson. Wayne's been a thought leader in this space, the data and analytics field since the early 1990s. He's the president of Eckerson Group. I was a client of Eckerson Group for several years and was so impressed I decided to join the company. I'm glad to be here. So Wayne, let me hand over to you. It's all yours. Yes, loving uh, the opportunity to talk to you about data products today. They are hot, hot, hot. And that's because they solve three main problems plaguing data users. And we see this every time we go into an organization and help them build a data strategy where we interview dozens of business users who are struggling to get data and use it for business gain. Those three problems are, they can't find the data. If they find it, then they have to wait because they can't access it. If they finally do access it, what they see, they don't trust. We say this time and time again, and I think data products are a great remedy for the, what ails a lot of data users and organizations today. So what's driving organizations to implement data products? Well, first and foremost, the desire to have trustworthy data. And secondly, the need to share data, give users quicker and broader access to the data that already exists. So those, those correspond directly to the things that I see are plaguing data users and organizations today. We also asked among other questions uh, that I won't go into today, uh, what challenges have you faced implementing data products? So it's really interesting here. This one that bubbled up to the top is creating a data product mindset. And that's interesting because if you think about it, every organization actually has a product team because every organization is offering or selling products and services to the public. But product knowledge, product implementation is an alien concept for data teams. So trying to put this mantra on has been very challenging. Second, defining a data product, getting everyone on board on what it is and what's expected of them, what's different than what they've already done, and then scoping it out for particular use cases. Second biggest challenge. The third and fourth challenges are related. They're all about once you've developed a data product, how do you get people to use it? Well, that requires publishing the product and making it easy for users to find and then marketing or promoting it. And then finally, governing the data products is a huge issue. If we want trustworthy data products, we're gonna to have to govern them. So data products in a way is a way for organizations to get really serious and kind of force themselves to do data governance in a legitimate way. So getting to that first, one of those first challenges, defining what a data product is, we're gonna spend a few minutes on that 
because there's still a lot of confusion in the industry about what a data product is. Is it a data set, a dashboard, is it code, ML model, et cetera, et cetera? And the answer really is yes, it's, it's actually all of those things. And one way to look at it is that the data products actually vary by the type of data consumer that wants to use it. So if your target user is a data engineer or data developer, your product is probably gonna be reusable code components like SQL code or Python code that developers can reuse in other implementations. If your target users are data analysts, your product might be reusable queries, metrics, and data sets. If the target user is a data scientist, it might be reusable features, models, and data sets. If it's a business analyst in finance or marketing or sales, it might be standard metrics, dimensions, and cohorts. If it's business executives, your data product might be a standard dashboard or a standard report. And finally, if it's an external customer or supplier, it might also be a, a product dashboard or a data set that your company is selling to them or adding as a service to a product that they already have. So I hope this explains the fact that data products are very diverse depending on who the audience is. So it's very important to understand who your target audience is. That's one of the best practices. All right, what are the key characteristics of a data product? Well, the very first thing to notice is that data products are a subset of data assets. And data assets are what we've been developing for years and years, decades really, using data warehouses, BI tools, data lakes, lake houses, what have you. Uh, but data products have some unique characteristics. As I said just now, it's targeted to a specific audience. It's designed for broad sharing uh, across organizational boundaries, both internal and external. It's designed for reuse. So you might see multiple versions of product over time. It's packaged with rich metadata, both business metadata and technical metadata. It's actively curated metadata. So there are data stewards assigned to that uh, data product and the metadata that describes it. And the product is systematically governed. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's done in a second. These first couple here, you might say, well, you know, those are all good. It's kind of like motherhood and apple pie. Are these things just data assets done right? Shouldn't we already be doing these things for all of our data assets? And you would be right there. Um, but some additional characteristics I've already put below here, managed by a product team, continuously improved over time, continuously funded, published in a data market. These things are actually pretty unique from what we've done in the past. And you can say that we're now starting to treat certain types of assets in our organization, like there, we would treat external products, but these assets really are for internal use. Now, I'm not sure I'm completely clear, so let's do the inverse here. It might be easier to understand what a data product is not. So a data product is not a one-off project. It's not usually built by a solo developer for a lone individual, for a one-time use without much oversight or active governance. That's what a data product is not. So a data product is actually the inverse of that. It's kind of what we've already talked about. It's a continuously funded program, not a project. It's built usually by a development team for a target user group to support many use cases over time with product manager oversight, and we'll describe that role in a second, and rigorous data governance. Uh, so hopefully that clears things up a little bit. And I want to talk about one characteristic in particular, the last one on the, the list from the prior slide, and that's the data market. Because I think a data market unlocks the true potential and value of data products. You can have a data product without a data market, for sure. But if you have more than a handful of data products, it really behooves you and your organization to implement a data product market, which is like a catalog for data products. And what a data market does essentially is automate the frictionless sharing of data products across organizational boundaries. So it picks up some uh, additional 
characteristics. One, a data market makes data products easy for data consumers to browse, search, and evaluate relevant content to them. A data market defines upfront who can view, access, and subscribe to data products. So users no longer have to wait for weeks or months to get access and permission to access some data set. A data market also defines through subscriptions who can consume what content for how long, at what frequency, and through what channels and delivery methods. Of course, you don't always have to subscribe to data products. You might do a one-time download, but on the whole, a lot of consumers are using subscriptions to access data content, data products. Also, data markets create contracts for what consumers can do with a product and what producers must deliver. Fifth, it specifies the price or cost or like a chargeback of the product, if any. And finally, a data marketplace supports the automatic delivery of a data product to a desired target via preferred channel in a specified format. So a lot of additional characteristics, valuable characteristics that a data market brings to data products. And my supposition is that within three to five years, all large organizations will have a data market to facilitate the automated data sharing across organizational boundaries, internal boundaries. The combination of a data product and a data market offers additional value. And we've kind of touched on some of these, but it behooves us to kind of review them. For business executives, it creates a culture of data sharing, a culture of analytics and data-driven decision-making. For product owners, it saves time fulfilling manual requests for data assets. For product consumers, it saves them time waiting for permission from product owners to access their data assets. And also it guarantees data quality and trustworthiness. For product managers, it makes it easy to publish data products, track them, and eventually retire them, and also gain feedback on what users are doing with them so they can bring new requirements back into the data product definition process. And finally, for data leaders, a data marketplace bridges data silos and enforces data governance. So now you might be wondering, well, what is this data marketplace and how do we run it? So the combination of a data market, which we've just described, and a data fabric, which it will reside on, is what I'm calling a data product platform or DPP, sometimes known as an internal data marketplace, a data sharing platform. I don't think the terminology is actually settled in the industry yet. So what this is, a data product platform, is essentially a data market or data producers publish data products um, for data consumers to browse, evaluate, and consume. So there's a product studio in the data market and a product store for consumers. And this all sits on top of a data fabric, uh, which enables organizations to source data, uh, both real time and in batch, uh, transform it, clean it, govern it, manage it, and turn it into data assets. And those data assets are what product managers and product developers use to create data products. Now, in reality, you may have a data fabric or something like it already, and all you really need is a data market. So you may, or you may even build the data market yourself. So you may build, buy, or mix and match any of these components. So uh, if you already have a data fabric or data infrastructure, you may just build or buy a data market and put it on top. But the thing that we're seeing now is that uh, many uh, products are coming onto the marketplace that do everything here. So you could buy the entire data product platform. Another point I wanna make is that because of the fabric, many of these data products will be virtual. In other words, they won't be a file sitting in an object store somewhere that you then make available through SFDC or something of that sort. Uh, they'll be generated on uh, in real time via executing a query, uh, a federated query, or maybe if it's a scheduled uh, delivery, uh, executing a multi-hop data pipeline. But in essence, the data product will be assembled uh, dynamically uh, upon request or delivery for the user. So I mentioned there uh, are now 
data product platforms that you can buy, uh, including the data fabric, sometimes with it, sometimes without it. Um, so we're seeing a number of vendors from different areas of our industry converge on this space and start delivering data product platforms. So the obvious group are these data commerce vendors who to date have delivered platforms for to support external data marketplaces. Companies like Harbor, Revelate, Narrative, and DAWX. Data catalogs are also uh, converging on this space. Uh, some of the smaller ones uh, that actually started life as data marketplaces, uh, like Think Data Works and Data.World. But data catalogs make an obvious starting place because they already have all the metadata. Uh, and really, they just need to flip a switch to turn those into data products. Data pipeline vendors, data integration vendors like Informatica, Nexla, Write Data are also moving into this space because they are the ones who are enabling companies to build out the data assets, uh, which form the foundation for data products. And then finally today, we'll hear about the two other categories, data analytics and master data. Uh, vendors from those spaces are moving into the data product platform space as well. Uh, and you'll hear later from Cogenity uh, and Tamer. And I believe uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think this is gonna be a hot space in 2024 and beyond, and many more vendors will enter this marketplace, making it much easier for you to implement a data product platform or a data or put a data market on top of your existing data fabric. All right, so now that we've defined data products, let's talk about how to create and govern them. So this is a picture of a data product lifecycle, and it shows a six step process so step one, define your target customers and gather their requirements. It makes sense to go interview them, understand their processes and workflows. Two, uh, start developing your assets, working in customer feedback and usage once you've finally deployed the product. Three, package your product up with business and technical metadata. Four, govern the product, make sure you have the right roles and reviews in place to certify products. Then finally, provision the products, make them available in your data market, provide training and support where necessary. And finally, monitor, track, iterate, optimize, and finally retire a product over time. And this is a, a kind of a closed loop process. So once you deploy a product, you wanna monitor it, see how people are using it or not, uh, make adjustments into your requirements, and development processes. So I wanna go through some of these in more detail. Probably the most important is the product manager role. We saw at the outset that creating a product mindset is the hardest challenge that companies are facing. So it behooves you to hire people into these roles who have product manage, manager experience. So a product manager is not a project manager, let me get that right. A product manager is not a project manager. It's also not a BI or data developer. And it's also not a data analyst or data scientist. Uh, and the tasks that I'm gonna cover here uh, in these concentric circles might be divided among multiple people playing different roles, product manager role, product owner role, which is usually the sponsor who secures the funding, uh, and a product marketing manager role who might be in charge of promoting the product, uh, tracking adoption, and bringing requirements back into the product definition phase. So a product manager, first and foremost, shapes the product. They interview target users, define user requirements, create product plans, present those plans to stakeholders, secure funding, and submit the product plan for a review to the product review board. Once that's done, they then ship the product or develop and ship it. So they'll develop the technical specs, coordinate with a development team, create a product version, operationalize that product, and then publish it to a data store. And finally, once it's been published, they'll market and promote it, monitor it, monitor its usage, solicit customer feedback, and adapt the product plan and manage product versions. 
So a product manager should be part of a product organization. And there may there are many different ways to organize a product team. So you may have a decentralized model where most business domains have their own data product team, like in a data mesh uh, methodology. And they might also have their own local data market to publish those products. But ideally, so it makes it easier for everyone in other domains to find those products. There's also an enterprise data market that consolidates the products across domains. There are definite pros here, local autonomy for the domains. There's less central overhead or central centralized bottlenecks. The disadvantages are that um, there may not be enough skilled, experienced product managers to go around. Uh, and when you decentralize product development, it's a good chance your products will get misaligned and start to conflict. And you may have some domains that don't have any product experience or development skills and go unserved. So some organizations, because of those disadvantages, uh, are going with a centralized model. Here, all the business domains feed their requirements into a corporate data product team, which publishes uh, the data products to an enterprise data market, and every domain can then access the products in that central location. So the advantages here are that you only need one data product team, so you can hopefully staff it with skilled people. Products are more likely to be aligned because it's all done centrally by one team, and that team can serve all domains, so there's no one left out in the cold. The disadvantage is, is that the domains lose some degree of local autonomy. There might be more centralized overhead and bottlenecks, uh, which most people want to avoid. So what I think will happen in reality is that your product team will probably be more of a hybrid of the two, uh, where you have a corporate team that creates data products on behalf of domains that don't have development skills or product skills, um, but allow product teams that do, or domains that do, build their own products, publish them to their own uh, data markets, and then there'll be one enterprise data market to consolidate all the data products across the domains. So the advantages here are many because it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Uh, there's product alignment because there is a strong central team. All the domains are served. Uh, business domains still have local autonomy if they want it, and there's fewer bottlenecks. The challenge might be that because there is a corporate team, there might be more overhead. Some people may have to wait in line a little bit, and we know business doesn't like that but I think this hybrid model tends to be the way most highly efficient organizations end up. So let's talk a little bit about data product governance. So we've talked about the product team, that's where it all starts. Um, so it's their job to come up with a product plan after they've interviewed a target, selected a target audience, interviewed users, come up with the requirements. You submit that plan then to a product review board who looks at, well, did the customers want this? Do we have the resources to deliver? Does it align with what we already have? What are our success criteria? And do we have the money to fund it? Uh, if they give it a green light, the product team then start work, starts to work with the development team to actually build out the product, which they then submit to a technical review board that reviews the product to see if it delivers as promised uh, does it adhere to enterprise standards? Is it secure? Is it private? And does it perform and scale? And if it gets the green light, then the product manager will publish to a data market. Um, and then uh, data consumers will browse, uh, evaluate, consume those data products and provide feedback, hopefully. And the product operations will monitor deployment, track fix errors, send alerts and reports, monitor usage, and provide feedback to both the product team and the technical development team as needed. So this is kind of an elaborate workflow for how governance might work in a data product organization. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's quite a lot <laughs> for some types of data products. And you're right. I think the degree of product governance varies by the type of data product and the audience you're, you're serving. So if you're building a dashboard meant for external customers or suppliers, it's gonna have heavy, rigorous governance associated with it. 
you'll probably go through that entire workflow, if not more. But if you're just delivering components uh, at the high end for data engineers and developers, the governance will be a, a much lighter weight. So what are the best practices? Uh, now that we know what a data product is, uh, how to create and govern it, uh, how do you succeed with it? Well, these are quotes from the survey, and we'd like to add your quotes if you take the survey. And I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll just point out a few that I thought were particularly relevant. Um, you know, before you start, make sure under, everyone understands what a data product is, and you've defined one uh, for a specific audience. Find executives who are willing to make a funding commitment to it over the long term. And three, seed your team with experienced product managers. So you, you get that product mindset from the get-go. A second set here are know your business problem, know your users for your product, create well-defined use cases, and then train a small number of creators. Iterate on your plan and build out as you go. That's kind of motherhood and apple pie for anything you do in our space, but particularly relevant for data products. And then finally, assign a governance group to decide the functionality of a data product and its enhancements and get customer feedback early in the design process. Uh, and two more, promote your products heavily, track adoption and usage. So in summary, data products are hot. That's because organizations want trustworthy data that is easy to find, share, and access. Data products aren't data assets. They have unique characteristics, such as they're targeted to an audience managed by a product team, reusable and shared, continuously funded and improved. The product organization is key. It educates, curates, governs, promotes, and secures continuous funding. And the data market unlocks the full potential of data products. It simplifies and automates the exchange of data products across organizational boundaries. And finally, data product platforms, which we talked about, they're emerging as we speak. And I think a majority of large organizations will have a DPP in three to five years. So with that, I'd like to uh, bring in our first practitioner, Michael Ross who's Senior VP of Technology at Blue Sky Specialty Pharmacy. And he's here to talk to us about his organization has implemented data products. So Mike, uh, let's see, are you on stage? Yeah, yeah, you come in there, great. Uh, so as I said, Senior Vice President of Technology at Blue Sky, where he leads digital transformation initiatives, impacting pharmacy operations and enhancing patient and physician experiences. His team has built 50 data products that developers use to convert into reports used by dozens of salespeople and business executives. So welcome, Michael. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, so let's just dive into it. We've only got about seven minutes. So you have a mantra to describe your data products. You like to say they're testable, usable, and lovable. Love that. <laughs> so what does that mean? What does that mantra mean? Absolutely. When we start applying uh, product management concepts to building data products, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the term MVP. And uh, we just felt like that that term means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So we landed on testable, usable, lovable as a way of really looking at the evolution of products and data products specifically along a continuum. So for us, testable is literally, we work to put something out there in the hands of users uh, as quickly as possible, almost to the point where we're slightly embarrassed by it. The point is we wanna kickstart that conversation as quickly as possible. We wanna get, uh, we wanna address data quality issues early. We want to make sure that we're speaking the same language. And so really we, largely what we do is we have a tool, Cogenity, that we use to run queries, throw it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then we start having those conversations with our users. Through a lot of repeated testing and interactions with users, we in turn get to a usable status. That means that our users can actually use it without our help. They can come in and run queries on Cogenity themselves. We can automate a report and send it to them on occasion. Uh, we can put it into a, a web application. Finally, we get to lovable, and that's really where we get sort of the holy grail of our product development lifecycle. 
it gets to a point where it becomes an indispensable part of our users' daily lives. That's excellent. So you have uh, product owners for these, these products. What is the role of that product owner? What do they do uh, or not do in your environment? Sure. Uh, for us, product owners really bridge that gap between our user community and the technical team. Uh, they help convert a lot of the requirements and needs that we identify in our user testing and translate them into executable uh, work items and tasks for our engineering team. So in a lot of ways, they wear a BA hat and, and do a lot of the things that you might find in a traditional product owner or scrum master type mindset in an agile team. Yeah, terrific. Uh, how many product owners do you have? At present, we have two, uh, hoping to add a third and possibly a fourth next year. Did they come with product management experience or did they kind of learn on the job? Uh, yes, they did. Uh, one, um, we are a, a specialty pharmacy working in healthcare. We were fortunate enough to find a, uh, an experienced and seasoned product owner, product manager uh, from another healthcare company, um, technical technology company. And then we have another one who um, doesn't quite have the healthcare background, but uh, he does, in fact, have product owner experience at, a, at another SaaS product company. Excellent. So you've paired those product owners with a product council. Can you explain the role of that council and who sits on it and how it sure. works? Sure. Yeah, our product council is largely comprised of senior leaders within the organization. So uh, we have a VP of pharmacy operations. We have various trade relationships that we have in our industry. We have specific people involved and tasked with building relationships with insurance providers for our pharmacy. And they all sit on our product council. Uh, they tend to drive a lot of the traditional product management conversations, interacting with outside users uh, that we interact with uh, with the pharmacy. And they also uh, help us align and drive priorities. Uh, key challenge that we have at the pharmacy is we, we get a lot of requests every day for various reports, for various insights, for pieces of information. What the product council does is really serve as a steering committee. Uh, not only do they provide a lot of that insight into the market, but they also help us drive priorities. They let us know what we should focus on that will provide the most value and benefit uh, for our organization and what we should probably not be focusing on, even though we're going to get a lot of questions or requests around it. Yeah, so let's go back to your data products. So just to be clear, I mean, when you're creating a data product, it sounds like it's kind of a, a SQL query that will be the foundation for a report. Is that true? Uh, that's how most of our data products start. We, we spend a lot of time in that testable phase not only trying to understand what we need to deliver, but really to get to the heart of the need, pain, or problem we're trying to solve for. And so very often our data products start as a very simple SQL query. We take a data set, we put it into Excel, pretty it up, and we send it out. Um, now, a lot of those products evolve. Uh, we do have a set of web applications uh, that support what we call our engagement platform. And so a lot of times these uh, data products will evolve into screens or interactive features in, in those engagement tools. So it starts out as a query, turns into an Excel report, and then maybe becomes part of a, a larger application. I think the point is, is that it's going to be something that the company uses on a, a long-term basis to drive its business. Is that true? 100%. Um, I think uh, my experience in other organizations and something we strive for at uh, Blue Sky to avoid is to cut out a lot of the non-valuable work activities. And so by maintaining continuous alignment, you know, I always like to say we can only go as fast as our weakest link. And with a lot of these types of programs, I find that our weakest link is, in fact, our relationship with the broader business community. So if we're aligning ourselves we're the, in the areas of the organization that we can provide the most value, it almost makes the funding conversation easy. Um, we go so far as to even align our staffing and our expenses with those prioritization concerns. So hopefully my product owner isn't having to deal too much with that stuff where 
we're focusing on data products for trade, for example, we're aligned with the trade part of the organization. We're not trying to make week to week prioritization decisions with things that aren't related to trade. Right. So you have 50 data products now. Does the maintenance of those data products impinge on your development team's ability to create new ones? It can. And it's certainly a lot of uh, where uh, my development team spends a lot of time uh, talking. Um, we use that continuum and life cycle also as an opportunity to discuss how can we make sure this is reliable? How can we make sure the data is accurate? How can we make sure uh, that we can support this? And so by starting early and starting small, we manage those conversations in parallel with our business feature capability conversations and looking for opportunities to consolidate and, and generate reuse. Have you ever retired a data product yet? Yes, actually, uh, a lot of our requests or a lot of our data products um, quickly realized that they were a very short term need. Um, they were there's not a lot of reusability. They don't align with the evolving view of how our company views claims data, for example, or various like PDC calculations that we use in the pharmacy. And so those things just don't survive much past the testable phase and they they sort of fall by the wayside and retire. Well, it's good to hear that you've gone through the full life cycle. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, yeah. most, most companies don't ever retire anything that they build uh, and then it just gets in the way and clogs up the pipes. Yeah, I find that that's usually a direct result of um, over investing and over developing too soon, taking our users too literal. Uh, I get asked for complex, snazzy dashboards all the time. And uh, I think at this point, most of our users and executives have realized the first thing they're gonna get is an Excel spreadsheet from us. Yeah, uh, good question from the audience from Sanjo. How does the Data Product Council align with the Data Governance Council, assuming you have a Data Governance Council? Yeah, yeah these are all great questions for um, much larger organizations. Um, we are just not at that point yet. So our data, uh, our data council is, or I'm sorry, our product council is largely comprised of people who would also be part of our data governance council. Um, as we grow, I invert, I envision those roles to start to diverge. Those are when we would start splitting off, say, a data governance council. Yeah, two questions that are related. Uh, the structure that you're outlining helps a lot with securing funding and who pays for your data products and quantifies their value. So who pays for our data products? Um, it largely just comes out of the core budget. We, we centrally manage our budgets and uh, I work hand in hand with our CFO uh, on a regular basis, um, ensuring that we're aligned with the core strategic priorities of the organization makes those conversations with our CFO much, much simpler. As far as how do we quantify that value uh, we actually tend to operate off of um, McKinsey's Three Horizons model. So we maintain very uh, specific focus on what is our core business, what are the business areas we're looking to extend into, and then what are our big dreams that are far further down the road. And we try to ensure that we maintain specific goals and strategies in each and make sure that our technology budgets are well aligned. Okay, last question. How do you define types of data products, technical versus data? What are the differences between technical product manager and data product manager? Maybe that last question is the most relevant, if there is a distinction in your organization between the two. Yeah, for, um, for our situation, I would say there's not a distinction. Um, there's certainly going to be a distinction in other types of businesses, but our core focus and our core product is bettering the, our patient lives making sure that if you have a prescription for Humira, how do we make sure that we can get that filled in a timely fashion and help you work through all of the red tape that's involved in, in the healthcare industry. So that is, is and has, that has always been and will continue to be what our core product is. And then we have to align our organization to match. And so a lot of those traditional product roles, especially as you look at product management roles, we lean on the business rather than try to self start and self fill those roles inside of our technology organization. 
Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time today and your insights. I uh, appreciate your presence here today. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. So our next practitioner speaker is Anupam Nandwana. And as he's coming to the stage, I'll introduce him. He's the CEO of P360, a decades old software company that specializes in business technology for pharmaceutical and life sciences companies worldwide. The company helps customers create golden records that get inserted into reports and applications used by data analysts, data scientists, salespeople, and back office staff. Welcome, welcome, Anapalm. Thank you, Wayne, pleasure to be here. Well, terrific. So let me ask, you're in the life sciences, pharmaceutical industry. Why is it important for those types of companies to embrace data products? So one of the things about the pharmaceutical industry in specific is one of the richest uh, industry from the data perspective. They have more data and everything they do is driven by data decisions. The companies itself are usually like three part companies. They are in the clinical trials, supply and manufacturing and the commercialization. So even though they all report on the same balance sheet, they operate largely independent of that with the one common goal of making patient lives better and educating HCPs, the healthcare professionals to provide the service they need for that patient. And while doing that, as the science is evolving, the finding the patient, finding the doctors and educating them is becoming increasingly challenging. The area we specialize on is the commercial side of the equation. So if I were to summarize, it's like the informed decision making all the way from trials to the commercial launch, it's significant. And things like data product helping tremendously uh, in getting the care patients need as quickly as possible. Yeah, so let's drill down into your data products. When you say that, what are you specifically thinking about? What is a data product to, to you and P360? Thank you, and it's a great question. So if I may take 30 seconds of your an audience time to explain. So if you just take like a commercial organization in a typical pharmaceutical company, they have several independent groups which operate under that. You have sales, you have marketing, you have market access, you have patient access, uh, manage care. So these groups, even though they share a lot of data assets underlying, they kind of have different objectives and different usage of data. And by the nature of the business, it ends up becoming very siloed and fragmented because everybody's asked to do their job. And that creates a significant challenge in terms of how the governance is done. And if you ask me what's the biggest barrier, I would say governance is a challenge. Fragmentation and silos are a challenge. Because of the amount of data they process, the data quality is consistently an issue. And if you take outside of the technical challenges, there is a huge regulatory burden on these companies. There are risks. So ability to make a change is not like as easy as like if you would have in the retail or manufacturing where you have a lot more liberty because you are answerable to FDA, you are answerable to all the local authorities, you are talking about people who and their health and their lives. So risk uh, taking ability is not as big as some of the other industry. And that creates this combination of barriers and adoption challenges, which you have to overcome. But I am very hopeful and very optimistic about how the data products get adopted and solving some of these challenges. So in the slide that uh, is on the screen right now, um, I wrote the type of data product is a, a golden record or master data that gets inserted into reports and applications. Is that a fair statement of what you think a data product yeah. is? As trivial as that statement might sound, let me double click on it. If you think about a master record of a healthcare professional, a doctor, uh, there are so many elements to that doctor. What uh, specialty they practice in? Was that specialty approved 
by FDA for our drug promotion? Uh, are my reps trained into talking to the institution we are, because you could legally get tagged as promoting your drug for an off-label promotion and no company ever wants to get tagged that because that's a legal uh, issue. So down to that level, so now you have this one healthcare professional record which can trans, which gets used in every single data analysis that whether it's an aggregated or detailed analysis impacts everything you do same thing you if you bring in the patient data like you were talking with mike about specialty pharmacy pharma companies are not supposed to know who the patient is so uh, buying the data which is anonymized and there are engines out there which hide the phi and pii's and taking all that data to make the business decision where the patients are where the doctors are it's huge in terms of the impact I will give you an example. There are some companies we are working with. Their drugs have less than thousand patients all over the country, or there might be other drugs which might have a couple thousand patients. So when you talk about the importance of data and the master data, how this all is linked, uh, that gives you an idea how important and critical that is. Yeah. So it seems like these master records really are foundational for almost any data product that you would create in the organization. So create a strong foundation, get your reference data, your master data standardized, bake it into a product, and then you can do lots of magical things after that. Right, because at that point you have labor, like they buy a lot of data externally and generate a lot of data internally. Now, if you have your master data side standardized as a data product, and whether it's your Payer, PBM hierarchy, whether you read CPs, now you are playing with such an advantage, so you don't have to worry about those things. Yeah. Uh, so, what are the biggest barriers to the adoption of data products that you're seeing out there as you roll these out? I think one, which is the technical, is like sheer amount of data, right? Like how big and complex the footprint is in some of these pharma companies itself is a barrier, and then. A common ownership like you could have different owners it is not like what you were explaining earlier it cannot be the owner of the data product right it can facilitate it you need business users and the subject matter expert who understand it but sometimes the authority or lack of technical expertise on their end could become a barrier cost and infrastructure is always an issue also most pharma companies, uh, at least mid to big size companies, they operate at a global scale. Some of them operate in 80, 90, 100 countries. So the decision making is not as simple as, okay, I'm going to change X, Y, or Z, or I'm going to adopt a tool because this works for me. Uh, it has a significant impact. And if you step outside of just commercial side and some of the other areas, like if you take manufacturing as an example, and I'm sure a lot of people in audience would have heard stories about vaccines during the COVID times, how they were manufacturing. There are plants in 30, 40 different locations, and there is a whole, this mixture of things moving from one place to other. How you manage that, the sheer complexity of the business operation itself is a hurdle sometimes. Yeah, so, so trying to standardize on a golden record across hundreds of systems and stakeholders is daunting. And I suspect that you're probably relying on artificial intelligence to help at least reconcile what's out there and, and present something to these stakeholders for their uh, approval and agreement. Oh, I couldn't agree more. If there was uh, one industry which would benefit from AI driving a lot of this is probably the life sciences, the pharma. I'm yeah. sure everybody will get the benefit of it. It's the probably lowest hanging fruit from the industry perspective. Yeah. Right. So assuming these pharma life science companies have this foundation built on these types of data products, how will this transform what they do? That's my last question. So the transformation is pretty upfront and straightforward. Getting drugs to the patient who need, uh, getting the education to the doctors who need the material and the information they need, communicating with insurance companies like 
I will give an example. Sometimes it could take up to two months just for a prior authorization approval process for some drugs for a patient to come on board after their doctor has diagnosed and prescribed them certain. So reducing that onboarding time in those kind of situation. There is a blog on NIH website and it's a fascinating stat. Like one day of delay in a clinical trial could cost a life sciences company anywhere from $600,000 per day all the way up to $8 million. So think about the just dollars and cent impact. It's like, of course, the business and the life impact, you also have a commercial interest in making these processes better. Well, terrific. Uh, Anupam, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your insights. Thank you. I enjoyed the conversation. Okay, so that ends the first section of our event today. Uh, next up are featured presentations by Rick Hall, CEO of Congenity, and Anthony Dayton, General Manager of Tamer. These are short uh, presentations that will dive deeper into specific uh, aspects of data products. Excellent. Thank you, Wayne, Mike, and Adapan. Now we have some featured presentations followed by an expert panel. We're gonna start with how to create data products as reusable data components, the key to data agility and value. This will be presented by Rick Hall, CEO of Cogenity. So Rick has spent nearly three decades in the analytics industry. This includes designing and implementing over 100 systems and analytic products. Following Rick, we're gonna hear from Anthony Dayton, Data Products General Manager at Tamer on demystifying data products, essential insights for business and technical buyers. So Rick, over to you. Great. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Wayne, for putting the event together. And of course, thank you, uh, Michael, for uh, your uh, presentation. It's always great to hear a customer and what they're doing with our stuff. Uh, Wayne, if you can uh, advance there. So just to set the stage for what we're trying to do, we're in a world today where only a third of chief analytics or data officers indicate they're achieving their RI goals. And moving ahead, uh, what we hear is that over half of data leaders indicate problems with quality data. Nearly the same number indicate reuse is a challenge. We hear significant problems with rework and oftentimes with data quality and inconsistent in, in results moving ahead. So if you look at the past year, we've had this enormous turnover in data leaders and CDAOs who reached its highest level in 2023 with nearly half of all data leaders, according to Randy Bean, who surveys these folks have been replaced. So, you know, that's a real problem, right? If we think about where we are as an industry, are we achieving the value that we want to achieve uh, in the time frame that we want to achieve it? So when I think about data products, I think about it in this context of how do we build an infrastructure and a process that's going to allow us to achieve quality with our results and do so quickly in a business environment that is under constant change. So in my thinking about data products, we think about that in an architecture that needs to support rapid change. Moving ahead, we think of that in terms of four key principles that I'm gonna talk about and get into details around what we think of as a component-based strategy for data products. And it really starts with the delivery of quality granular data. Oftentimes granular data is hidden from the business, buried in a deep pipeline when we're trying to deliver a report but when business folks need to answer questions that are unanticipated, that data needs to be available. We see the critical need to empower business teams uh, because they need to move quickly. We can't deliver everything that a business needs for analytics through a central team. It's just not realistic anymore. And, but we need to also be able to curate the results of those business users so that we can identify what's most useful uh, in the business and ultimately to foster collaboration and reuse. I wanna talk about these principles uh, and what it means in terms of how you implement data products. Moving on. So let's start with granular data products. I, before starting Cogenity, uh, I ran the data team for retail sales at Nielsen. 
And we built large pipelines that had to span the globe to analyze price impact and promotion based on a history of activity. Well, if you think about the work that we did, we didn't think about COVID impacting the business. You know, so along comes 2019 and ultimately 2020, and suddenly COVID's out there. And we have more and more business teams all over the world who need to be able to analyze their business in a changing environment. And those models that we've built over a period of time uh, are no longer gonna work. So one of the challenges I think that we all face in analytics is when we build big structured analytic deliveries that when business changes, we often need to be able to get back to the granular data and look at it in a different way. So exposing granular data as a data product is the foundation in our point of view. So what does that mean, building granular data products? So the characteristics of a data product that Wayne talked about absolutely apply. You know, there's ownership and accountability. We see particular for granular data products that ownership being as close to the source as possible. We want them, of course, to be discoverable, clearly named, uh, that they have some known quality and a timely delivery, and they have appropriate security and access applied. All those things are standard for any thinking about a data product. But when we think about granular data products, they also have minimal aggregation and transformation. So they're really as close to uh, the source as possible. They are cleansed, they do have quality, and they have master data linkage so we can link them to other data assets or data products across the organization. So if we build granular data products as a foundation, we can support known use cases, those dashboards that we need to deliver. We can also support unknown use cases uh, that are gonna come up in a changing business environment. So if you think about kind of a lake house architecture that lots of folks talk about a medallion architecture, you might think of granular data products in the silver layer. So they're one step up from raw data, they've been cleansed, they have some accountability, but they're gonna be flexible to be used in multiple ways in the business. Now, if we built those products, we ultimately want to deliver them both for known use cases and to empower business teams to do things that we didn't anticipate. A conversation with CDA of a large health company recently, 200 members of his team, 6,000 uh, folks who need to analyze data, no way they can keep up with that demand. Ultimately, the ability to enable access to data products, embrace data literacy in the business and provision self-service tools uh, like the kind that uh, Michael's team is working with, that's uh, what you need to do. Moving ahead. Ultimately, however, if we have business teams building their own analytics, we need to identify what's most useful from that process. So if you think about the kind of governance process that uh, Wayne talked about, you might think of that as kind of a top-down organizational structure. Well, if we've got people on the business also building analytics, we need a bottoms up process that's gonna allow us to curate the best of that work and make it available to other users. So we need empower users to be able to publish content. We need to identify and implement components that others can use. And ultimately that's gonna be enabled by an analytic catalog and a publishing process that allows these reusable components to be available. Moving on. So when we talk to people in the business, there's a number of things that we hear from customers. You know, 80% of data engineers and business analysts, those folks out in the field, need to be able to share their work. 70% of those folks do so in a highly unstructured way, with emails or chat or shared files. 20%, uh, perhaps mostly on the engineering side, uh, use some structured tool, whether it's a Git repository, Jira, or something like an analytics catalog that we provide. And half of data leaders talk to turnover as a critical challenge. So we've got this critical need to reuse work. We've got turnover happening in the business. And what do we see? We see things like this, where I can't find the analysis I need. When I do, the documentation is poor 
and I'm not sure if the version is current. When analysts need to work together, this is not the environment we want to have. So we want to enable collaboration and reuse. And we do that by defining a clear repository of quality analytics. Those can be granular data products at the foundation. And there are a series of analytic data products that are built on top and ultimately perhaps delivered as dashboards or other things. And those analytic data products is where we're going to see metrics and aggregations and other kinds of macros that are suitable for downstream business use. Those are built on top of a foundation of exposed and available granular data products. And data products, of course, are managed, they're governed, they're approved, they're published. We have an internal marketing and awareness uh, capability. You know, uh, Wayne talked a little bit about that. Think of it as kind of a data store or a place you can access data. And we need all of that to be directly accessible from the environment where users are building and accessing data. So as Michael Ross talked about, sometimes that's as simple as a SQL query. They can pull from a catalog, they can use it. It might be a component of something else that they're gonna use. And then we need to think about how we're gonna build an, into our organization and facilitate a process where we're training folks to think about reuse from the get-go and to think about the fact that the data products they're building are not only going to serve the use that they start with, but they're oftentimes going to be foundational to address those unknown use cases for which we have all these business analysts floating around the organization who in many cases today are pulling data and putting in Excel and doing something different because they're not in a situation where they can easily wait for a central team to deliver that result. So if you think about what does this mean in the real world? So if I take that kind of consumer goods example, you know, what we were doing at Nielsen, we we're building analysis for understanding sales and promotional activity uh, and helping field sales folks deliver to the business. So we had a whole series of foundational data sets, retail sales, uh, shipments to retailers, promotional activity. Those sets of data came together to build a set of higher order analytics, things like expected sales, incremental sales, promotional profits, et cetera. Uh, we looked at stockouts and lost opportunities, actually a whole series of complex things. And we delivered initially very much in a traditional fashion where we had large, complex, SQL and other things that were not exposed, and we exposed the promotional dashboards or the field sales dashboards. Moving ahead, what that meant is when the unplanned happens, you know, new retailer, some weather event, corporate competitive activities, COVID hits, it all had to come back to that central team. They're the only folks who could see the underlying capabilities and people had to wait in line. So what's a different approach? So we think about components of reusable analytics as a better way. So if we expose retail sales and shipments and the expected promotional activity as data products, not only can they service the dashboard that we built and deliver it as a critical data product, but they can also service the unexpected use case. And we see those use cases delivered in a self-service manner where business users or in some cases engineers can go directly to known data products at a more foundational level and they can self-service and build their own analytics. And I indicate that kind of at a different color here, yellow, because initially they're developed on their own and they're used uh, on their own. Uh, in some cases, they might just be using the initial retail sales and a combination of calculations that are stored separately uh, as components. However, if you move on here, ultimately, if you have a process of curation, what initially started out as self-service analytics can be curated and available in the catalog for others to use. So we start out with an environment, certainly where we're going to deliver these promotional dashboards in this case but we do so by building a series of reusable components that are published as data products in our catalog. Those support our known use case. They also supported some unknown use case, 
a business user or a business analyst can address that unknown use case by reusing the components that we've built. And that result can be curated and available to others for reuse. And if you think about this kind of environment, it's really different than kind of the traditional top-down centralized data warehouse world. It's much more analogous to an open source world where users are able to work and build their own stuff and contribute to a better way of doing things. So if you think about this, then if you have an analytic catalog that's available for reuse, not only do you have clearly defined calculations that others can use, that is also foundational uh, when you think about how you're gonna apply things like generative AI to your business, right? We've all seen the examples where Gen AI can produce some great SQL queries, but how does it know what the calculation is of expected sales? And how does it know where to get that in a correct way in order to use it to answer a business question? Well, it needs to be able to get it from a catalog of available analytics that are built over time, initially to support known use cases, but evolve in a component oriented fashion. So when we think about data products, we're thinking about it in this larger context. We're thinking that data products are ultimately gonna support what we know about today and what we know about. We're gonna evolve our data organization with a collaboration between our engineering teams and our business teams. Uh, we're gonna see things evolve. Uh, and as they evolve, we're gonna publish them and make them reusable uh, for others. So it's a very brief view of our thinking, and I will pass it back over to uh, Wayne and Kevin. Okay, thank you very much, Rick. So now we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna hear from Anthony. Anthony Dayton, Data Products General Manager at Tamer. As I said, his presentation is Demystifying Data Products, Essential Insights for Business and Technical Buyers. Anthony has extensive experience and expertise in building and scaling enterprise software companies. All right. I think we are somewhat live. I, I've been led to believe that I was uh, introduced uh, before. And so uh, no need to do uh, another introduction. Thank you for the thumbs up, very helpful. And uh, just, I'll add my own uh, very quick introduction. I worked uh, in the data analytics industry for for many years. And one of the questions that came up in the Q&A during the first session uh, asked the question, is, is this all just buzzwords and hype and the latest marketing thing? Uh, or is there something really new uh, going on here? Uh, and having worked in this industry uh, for a long time, uh, it's my conjecture that there really is something new and interesting going on as it relates to data products. Um, and the very quick version of why I'm going to get into this in a, in a second, is we've largely solved the data storage problem and we've largely solved the data consumption problem, analysis and visualization problem. Uh, the challenge that's in between these two layers where people don't trust the data that's flowing from these really high quality storage systems into these really easy to use consumption endpoints. And that's why I believe uh, data product represents something interest, very interesting. Over the course of this presentation, uh, I want to touch on a couple of the key things uh, that Wayne uh, asked uh, as a, when he kicked off. And one of the things he talked about right up at the beginning is one of the number one challenges uh, that everybody's talking about when it comes to data products is what are these things? Like, what's the definition of a data product? The second thing on the list was how do you create them and what does that mean? And I'm going to get into that into the next set of slides right after this. But starting with the, the definition, this is the definition that we use uh, consistently when we talk to customers and users uh, about a data product. Um, so data product is a consumption ready set of high quality, trustworthy, accessible data that people use to make decisions or to solve their business challenges. And there's a couple of really important ideas in here. Um, the first is this focus on consumption ready data. So rather than thinking about trying to manage the mess of source data, really focus your data product initiatives and energy on the uh, consumption-ready data, the, da the data that sits at the point of decision. 
Um, the second sort of important idea here is a focus on quality, trustworthiness, and accessibility. And again, Wayne sort of pointed to this with things like governance councils and things like that. Uh, we think there's some technical solutions to some of these challenges as well, which we'll get into, but really focus on quality as, as an outcome. Uh, and then this idea that many people should be accessing uh, and using this. This is a really kind of key idea behind data products. And someone else in the comments in the first session, the Wayne session, asked the question, how much of this is traditional data product manage or digital product management uh, techniques just applied to data? And I think that's actually a very insightful uh, question. And I think it's exactly right that a lot of the things we're talking about here are really applying really traditional product management techniques to data. So I talked about this a little bit a, a second ago. The, the challenge on the data side, if you think about this as consumption and then uh, sources, on the sources side, uh, you know, the challenge has never been more acute. Uh, we used to have this idea maybe in the 90s or 2000s that the, the world of data was going to solve itself because all of your enterprise data was going to end up in your data lake or your data warehouse. And then there'd be a, a singular reporting tool that everyone would access. And whatever dreams we had of this architecture <laughs> of becoming a reality have been blown away. The reality inside most organizations, the modern sort of data architecture that most of you are working with is you have many hundreds of sources and systems and you keep adding sources and systems uh, because you're looking to optimize those operational uh, systems that your users are using. Sure, they're ending up inside these cloud uh, data warehouses, but now they're being consumed by a myriad of different consumption endpoints. So uh, every day it feels like there's a new way of, of accessing that data to get value out of that data. And the reason this is, uh, the pressure this puts on the system is that we need to get more from the data that we're tracking and managing as an organization. They we're putting a lot higher or heavier requirements on that data. So it really needs to be as clean and standardized as possible. Typically, you're looking for a lot of attributes because you want to have a lot of dimensions and measures in your analysis. Uh, you wish you could bring this together to get a single view of that customer or the supplier or whatever the entity that matters to you is. Um, and then inevitably, when there are challenges and there are problems with that data, you want a way of providing that feedback into the system. So uh, and the problems become only more acute when we think about building models or AI models on top of this data. Uh, we talk about model hallucination. I've done a, an entire session um, uh, on this uh, a couple of weeks ago. This idea that when you have data that's of poor quality or has embedded biases and then you build models on that, uh, you can actually introduce uh, and amplify those biases or those hallucinations uh, inside your processes, and that's a terrible thing. So the quality and important, the cleanliness of the data has really never been uh, more important. And then if you think about the teams of people that are working to, uh, to solve this problem, your data teams, many of you are probably either managing these data teams, these data teams or thinking about building these data teams, uh, they simply can't keep up. There's too much work for folks to do. Uh, and in a way, there's this really uh, difficult challenge, which is the data teams are working really hard. But decision makers are frustrated with the speed and quality that they're getting out of these data teams. So it's sort of like the customer's upset and the supplier can't keep up. And you know they they really want uh, this asset that you have, which is this high quality data, but they really can't get it. They can't get it at pace. So if we if we look at how people are trying to solve this problem and how data teams work today, they typically work on a use case approach. Uh, that is to say, they go project by project and they try to build a, a, in a sense, a custom set of data for each request. And so if someone comes along and they says, hey, you know, I, I really would like to have a, a sales forecast. And somebody goes and builds a pipeline that connects together a whole series of sources uh, and delivers that sales uh, forecast. And then, of course, inevitably it's not right. So there's feedback that comes in, to, but that feedback is um, single channeled <clears throat> between the user of that data and the product person or the person of the data team uh, who built it. And then we repeat this process across every single uh, request uh, and it becomes uh, unmanageable and becomes 
spaghetti code. So you have hundreds of pipelines that are overlapping. Uh, a bug in one gets propagated through hundreds. Uh, when you go to fix something, you have to fix it in 38 places. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a disaster. Uh, instead, if we can think about managing this as a product, you can think about these core entities that matter to you as a business. Who are my customers? Who are my suppliers? What products do we sell? Who are the employees that work at our organization? And build products around those key entities. Uh, and the value here, of course, is uh, th this drives reusability. So when you focus at an entity level, and you think about these key entities that matter, uh, then you can start building these uh, analyses off of them, the sales forecast, the territory planning analysis, whatever it might be. Um, and by building this for, at an entity level, you can now consolidate the feedback across all of these different uh, data products. And so you move away from this model of one-off uh, pipeline creation to working at an entity uh, level. So now, how we achieve this, like what's the, the best practice for solving this problem? The, the challenge uh, in, in our industry, of course, is uh, there really seem to be only two solutions to solve this problem. Uh, one is we build bigger and bigger teams, throw people at the problem. Uh, so we have uh, many different source systems. They're unresolved. You can't look at that in, by an entity. So how do we solve the problem? Uh, I would joke this is uh, spreadsheets and VLOOKUP. It's like, you know, we dump the data in a spreadsheet and we spend hours trying to manually reconcile a, a bunch of different systems, uh, look at the data, figure out where there's standardization and quality problems and fix them up manually. Or the other solution we see is what I call lock it down, which is if we just never changed our data and everything would be okay, right? So we've put in place a, an MDM system, a master data system, and we tell everyone in the organization, no one is allowed to create data unless it conforms to this uh, central system. And uh, there's this line in Jurassic Park that says, life will find a way. Uh, I have the same feeling about data will find a way. So when you lock it down <clears throat> in these top-down governance systems, uh, inevitably what happens is data squirts out the side. Data will find a way to, uh, to avoid those systems. And so in a way, this introduces what I think is uh, the most important thing to take away from this presentation and conversation, which is there is a solution to this conundrum. I've had to throw people at the problem or lock it down. And that is AI. And this is the unlock that breaks the dilemma of the data product challenge. Uh, and the idea here, in a way, is deceptively simple, which is, as human beings, we're really good at these common data management tasks. If I show you IBM and International Business Machines, or IBM, comma, Inc., and IBM, you recognize intuitively that those are the same things. If I show you 015, 555, 234, and plus one, 415, uh, you intuitively know that's the same phone number, and you would be able to fix one up to look like the other. Uh, it turns out that computers are terrible at this task, or traditionally programmed computers are terrible at this task. And however, AI is really good at these tasks. And so we can train AI models to get really good at common data management uh, tasks. And that allows you to break this trade-off between throwing people at the problem and locking it down. It allows you to have the flexibility of a data product approach without having to build teams of hundreds or thousands of people sort of manually working through uh, the data. So this uh, AI approach, uh, so, sort of the way to think about this is think about all of the tasks that you, your team, do to manage data. And then think about how many of those tasks really require deep human intellect. Most of them are fairly uh, rudimentary tasks, and uh, but they're very difficult to program. If I asked you to program those tasks, say in Python, uh, you would find yourself with 100 nested if-then rules trying to sort of make that work. Uh, again, these are perfect tasks to hand to uh, AI. And so things like validation and cleaning, relationships between records, things that are the same versus different, 
uh, uh, enriching sparse data, so finding examples that allow you to fill in missing phone numbers or missing email addresses, that sort of stuff. Uh, and it benefits from this human in the loop feedback so that you can get uh, human guidance into, into the system. So maybe just to sort of step back a second here before I get into a bit more detail. Again, the, the simple idea here is the unlock for successful data products is AI. Uh, this is what allows you to get the flexibility your organization is demanding uh, while keeping uh, governance and security at the at the center of the of the challenge. So uh, the surprise tamers building such a platform for doing this with AI at the center. Um, the idea behind the uh, tamer platform is to allow you to manage data at an entity level, uh, use AI to resolve data together into those common entities, and then attach a set of platform services to gather feedback and metrics, like search that data, look at how that data shifted and changed over time, uh, and provide access to the data. Uh, and, and the benefit of this, of course, is that it breaks this uh, trade-off and allows your data teams, you, to support many more cases without having to throw hundreds or thousands of people at the problem with predictability and, and uh, sort of stay on top of your work, work uh, more, work smarter. And at the same time, uh, give the business teams what they want, which is frankly answers to their questions uh, and the ability to sort of work with this incredibly valuable asset that sits at the center of most organizations, uh, which is their data. Um, so let me walk through in the last few minutes couple of sort of examples of the challenges that we've seen uh, at a practical level in using this technology uh, and then some of the, and then the architectures that our uh, customers put in place to, to solve those. Um, so the one challenge we talked about is aggregating disparate sources. Uh, you have data, say in this example from SAP, Salesforce, Excel, you as a human can see that these data are all really the same person. It's Andrew, Andrew Wyatt. Uh, otherwise, AKA AJ Wyatt or Andy Wyatt. You see that, the computer doesn't see that. And there's no key relationship here. There's no uh, ID which links these together, or which they are ID, they just don't link them. Um, and that's a, you know, that is a, that is a big challenge. Second uh, challenge is the false trade-off between in, um, integrating data and integrating systems. So the other strategy you might take here, like, well, we'll just, use a data integration platform and literally wire these systems together manually. Um, or we're going to use a data movement tool and you know, copy data from one place uh, to the other. The architecture that we've seen in place with uh, a handful of customers as it relates to this is to use uh, the cloud data warehouse as a kind of central repository that becomes the landing zone for all of these different uh, sources. And what's really valuable about this is that those typically have many different interfaces, uh, different API endpoints that allow you to use streaming and direct uh, copy and paste to queries, uh, et cetera, to be able to land data in, in this example from a customer, uh, BigQuery. And it's at this point that we can take advantage of, of Tamer uh, to run the AI, resolve the entities at that layer, and drop a new table, which is the resolved entity at that point. Uh, and that becomes available to these uh, consumption endpoints. Uh, an example of this, another example of this is our customer NovaCure. They've been using Fivetran to uh, move data into BigQuery. Uh, and they use MuleSoft to move back the cleansed, in their case, uh, HCP and HCO um, healthcare providers uh, organizations uh, back into, in their case, SAP, while retaining the consumption endpoints of Viva where they're, allowed, where they're able to then update records uh, there. But they use uh, Google BigQuery with Tamer Clean the data there as that central repository of, uh, in this case, uh, healthcare providers. Lastly, and I'm uh, running low on time, <clears throat> how we think about system consolidation. So we have you know, a range of different systems. We want to sort of bring those together and give people uh, this uh, single version. Uh, Mutual had this challenge. Uh, they and put in place their own MDM system and a set of legacy MDM systems. They actually had three MDM systems across the business. Uh, and they wanted to, to switch over to a new system of record. Uh, they've been using uh, Tamer in that context as a real-time system of record for 
uh, policies, claims, and customers uh, in their case. Uh, and again, you see this, this common architecture here where you have uh, many sources on the left and many consumption endpoints uh, on the right. So let me leave you with a couple of key takeaways, things that you can hopefully use as you begin or continue your uh, data product uh, journey. Uh, and the first, uh, which is where I started, is really think deeply about your the outcomes and consumption endpoints. Start the conversation from the user back as opposed to the source and system out. Uh, this is a, again, if you think about this using the product analogy, rather than deciding what technology you want to build a product in and then build the product, think about what problem your customer has, your user has, and then engineer the technology that best supports that solution. Very similar in the context of this data. Uh, in that same spirit, the human interfaces for these data products are much more important than pipeline. Or to say it in a funny way, you can compromise on the pipeline, uh, don't compromise on making it an easy to use and accessible human interface. Uh, we, this came up in the first session, on, uh, but this idea of iteration and using agile to build the sort of minimum viable uh, first start is a really valuable strategy for making data products successful. Uh, going dark for six months and then delivering perfection is actually much worse than spending a week delivering something of value and iterating over six months. You end up in a much better place. Um, and then this distinction between build and buy, I would argue, uh, is a false one. Uh, you're going to do a bit of both. And so uh, recognizing that up front uh, is a really useful uh, trick, as it were. So that uh, I did uh, in the resources section. Uh, on the left, I dropped a couple links. I, I you know, normally would have shown you a demo, but you can go do your own demo uh, by going to our homepage. We have a couple of live demos on the on the, the uh, on the homepage. Uh, one you can just click through, and one where you can actually register, and we'll give you access to a system. Uh, also, I'm shamelessly plugging my Data Masters podcast, so you can uh, go check that out. And there's actually really uh, an ebook on data products we just published, which uh, I would encourage anyone to to take a look at and read. So out of that, I think that is my uh, allotted uh, time. Anthony, great stuff. Thank you very much. And I took some really good notes here, and so this is very helpful. We're going we're to transition to the expert panel. So thanks again, Anthony. Hi, all. Welcome back. Uh, we've assembled all of our featured speakers, as well as Kevin, our moderator, for this expert panel. And the goal here is uh, to have an open conversation and let you ask questions or make comments that we respond to. So please use the Q&A tab to insert your questions or comments, and we will inject them into the discussion. It's always a lot of fun when we do that. So before we open up the panel to a broader conversation with all of you out there in the audience, I have a few questions myself for the panelists, and they might have some questions for me. <laughs> All's fair game here. So. Rick, I'm going to start with you. In your presentation, you talk about component data products. So just to be clear, because defining data products is a big challenge, you know, yep. are you talking primarily about reusable SQL code that data engineers or analysts can create, store in a repository, others can use and reuse to create other data products, maybe higher level data products? Is that Kind of the it, it can be code, it, certainly. It also can be data sets, right? So, you know, it really depends on what the structure is that you're after, right? You know, my point is you got to make data available from the foundation. And in analytics, we got a lot of complicated calculations and we need to expose them to the business, right? Yeah. And uh, we expose them as components, right? That can be plugged and played and, and built together. Uh, certainly when you're assembling them, in most cases, you're assembling what ultimately is blocks of code, although you don't really have to think of it that way. It's a component, it has an interface, you can call it and uh, use it anywhere you need right. to. So let me ask you, how much reuse do you normally see with these types of components? Do you have, can you and put your finger on that anyway? I, well, I don't know that I have any stats. I can tell you that what we see is that most organizations have these big complex pipelines before they start embracing this idea, right? So, 
you know, they get data, they've got 2000 lines of SQL and then buried in that SQL is three calculations that they need to use over and over again. And if somebody needs to use that, they have to pull apart the thousand lines and figure out where that calculation is, right? That's the state of play of most analytic pipelines, I think, across the world. You know, others, ourselves included, have said, look, we got to break these into components that we can reuse. So, right. So uh, your tool not only generate helps them generate the code, but you actually have a, I think you call it analytic repository where they can store the important things they create for others to use. That's right. right. And, okay. and a publishing process where what's in the catalog you can trust. It's certified, it's versioned, you know, it's owned, uh, and it can address a specific thing. And it, that both allows somebody to quickly, a new analyst who needs to know, understand the calculation for promotional profitability, kind of a complex calculation, they can just grab that calculation. It's a reusable component and they can assemble it with other things. Excellent. Uh, and I think that's critical uh, to a world where we have both overloaded workloads for data teams. We have people on the edge needing to be able to get to that data themselves. Uh, and we have this need to ultimately support things like uh, generative AI that are gonna be able to find standard calculations for key analysis. Right, well said. All right, let me turn to Anthony. So Anthony, it seems that your conception of a data product is also foundational like Rick's, but it's more of a golden record along with functions to filter, modify, and monitor that record, make it really usable for business users. So is that a fair statement? Uh, yeah, totally fair statement. Uh, I guess the only uh, thing I would add to that statement is the use of or the reliance on AI as a mechanism of achieving that goal. And the reason I think this is important is that the idea of a golden record is certainly not a new idea. Uh, the issue is that generating those golden records historically has been a time consuming, challenging, human intense task that uh, is fraught with failure. <laughs> and uh, or as I like to joke, I've never met anyone who was excited to be a part of an MDM project. So, <laughs> yeah. so, which is a snarky way of saying it, it, it hasn't worked. And much like most people don't enjoy uh, writing emails or, you know, blog posts, and so they turn to chat GPT to help them with that uh, task. Uh, we believe there's an opportunity to uh, have AI step in and help with these common data management and data mastering techniques or tasks rather. Uh, and, and, and actually have that be a success. Yeah, I like your comment about MDM. We, we need a lighter way, quicker way to do data mastering. Uh, and I say that from experience because a lot of our clients, we, they bring us in to do a data strategy and they say, oh yeah, we're trying to do MDM, but it's never worked. And you know, it's almost like it's too big of a hairball to even touch. So- Sure, and the, and the I, reason it's too big a hairball is because there's too much data and it's a largely manual task. And so when you're faced with a large manual task, then naturally the only mechanism of, of you know, fixing that, that problem is to throw people at it or lock it down, make it a task that no one is involved in because we're not gonna change anything. God forbid we change anything, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, and both of those fail. One fails for, because of cost and one fails because of flexibility. I love that conversation, Anthony, because I think that, you know, when I think about these granular data products and I might think of retail sales, if I want to join that to something else, I need master data, right? And I need, need the a key. And I need the keys, right? And, uh, you know, if an AI engine like what you're proposing can do that, that's going to make the ability to share that data so much more valuable. So much of the conversation, like the data fabric conversation, has kind of ignored this topic, right? And if we're going to link data, we've got to have a way to do it. Uh, and we need to be able to expose data at the lowest level with the linkages available. So um, I got to inject here because you guys, as I said, are both playing at the foundational level of data products. And I didn't anticipate this when you guys became sponsors of this event. But it seems to me that you're the yin and yang of the of the foundation for data products. And maybe you guys need to partner as companies sure. to make that foundation much more usable and accessible to everybody. 
or at least to show them how how it can be done, so they don't, you know, mess around uh, with the sure. results. Okay. Yeah, we haven't had a chance that. to talk yet, but I know we are uh, aiming to, and we'll figure out ways to work together. Yeah, and I, I think this uh, the question of reusable components for managing uh, streams of raw data is uh, an extremely important one. Uh, Rick, to follow on your prior comment, these keys, these join relationships, that's you know, one of the areas that's been a, a sore point for people. And I totally agree with you that the data mesh vendors are just ignoring this problem and, and sort of saying, well, you know, assuming it'll get figured out. Um, so you, 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 know, you need a mechanism of linking the data. All right. So, um, Rick, you said that you see value in Tamer because it's a that technology is a way to link data that you guys create. So, I'm wondering, Anthony, how does it work in reverse? How do you see the value that uh, the Rick's technology could bring to you? Not, not that you had the full briefing yet, but no, no, no. So, I, I have a good sense for for what Rick's doing. So, actually, I think the credit he did a great job of. Of describing this, it, you know, a hairball of 2,000 lines of SQL uh, is just that. It's a hairball. You're never going to unwind it. And you cannot manage. Oh, let me say this actually in a, a slightly different way. Um, having been a software person for many years, no one would suggest that the way to build a good product is to build one long, you know, source file that everyone has to make edits in. Like no one works that way. Maybe you worked that way in like the 60s or something when there was some COBOL. Everybody's like, no, no, we build reusable components and then we, you know, we subclass things and we do, uh, you, know, you know, we reuse things. We have a, a scalable architecture for how we build new things. You know, the idea of doing that for data is, uh, is a brilliant idea and really important. Yeah. Excellent. With you there, right? That's our world. That's what we think about. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to this partnership and the fruits that will bring for the whole industry. Because it seems like it's, you know, at the foundation for data quality and you know the core metrics that run a company. I mean, what could be more basic than that, right? If you don't get that locking and tackling done, the master data and the core metrics, you've got nothing, right? So well, we'll have to reconvene a webinar are... in six months, and uh, you guys can announce to the world what you've come come out with. Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> All good. All right. So I'm going to let you guys put me on the spot. Do you have any questions for me based on what I presented? Did you agree with all of it or not? <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that, you know, kind of you and I have talked about this, right? You know, people sometimes think of data products as, you know, anything and everything to do with data. And certainly I agree with the idea that we need to apply product management discipline throughout. If that means at the end of the stream of, you know, of, uh, a, of, of a dashboard, that's fine. But I do think that um, governance can't just be, you know, a top down function. And I would just, you know, kind of suggest that thinking about how you think about that outside of the data team for all those business users who are using data on their own today. How do you bring them into this environment? I would just encourage you to think about that in your discussion. Yeah. So what, what's interesting is I presented that pretty elaborate governance workflow. And I don't think you do that for at this component level, right? I mean, it's maybe Rick, you could explain like, for instance, what Michael does to govern. Well, we talked about it a little bit. It's a much lighter touch at the component level, I would assume. Uh, well, it, it is, but it is only in the sense that uh, people who have access to data products can do their own thing first, right? So there isn't a process that says, I can't use this data for my business problem if it's certified data. The process then of publishing that, uh, which is essentially the governance process, is a simple process in our world. It's really uh, you call it an approval process that's built right into the tooling uh, without a giant council. Uh, so somebody has the authority to approve a component to make it available to others. So if I have access to three data products and I can build a fourth, I can build that fourth myself in my world. If I want that fourth to be published and used by others, it has to go through a publishing process to make it approved so that now the catalog, the, what we call the analytics catalog, 
is stuff that anybody can trust or anybody who has security access to certain components can trust. So it's just the bottoms up process for us is just the process of validating which things get published and used. Yeah. So that approver is what? The head data engineer, head data analyst? I, it, well, they, you know, they kind of have a product role, right, for that particular segment, but they can be, you know, a lot of organizations do it differently. I think in Michael's team, his product owners are the ones who are ultimately approving uh, additional stuff. I don't think in his world, he'd, we'd have to ask him, I haven't had a chance to talk to him about this. He has business teams who are actually building their own products out of products, right? But that is certainly something that we see. Yeah. Well, Anthony, you were about to say something. Yeah, so I was going to give you, so if I had feedback for the way you frame the data product story, uh, I would encourage you frame the problem as uh, sort of tooling up. Uh, and I would think about these consumption endpoints uh, back. So rather than thinking about it from the entity or from the type of uh, the consolidated set of data that matters, uh, rather than trying to think about, you know, whether it's code or the artifacts that sit behind that. Uh, and the reason I argue uh, this is important uh, is that it follows a, a similar both, you know, problem and also opportunity when it comes to, you know, building real products or consumer products or any product oriented thing, which is we tend to think about the tools we have and the assets we have and then to decide what product we could build with it, as opposed to starting with the, the user need or the customer pain and working uh, backwards and saying, okay, well, given that the, the world needs a this, you know, how is it we can construct a this? Um, yeah, so. totally agree. Yeah, thinking right to left, sometimes they say from the business back to the technology, wholeheartedly agree. And that came out in the survey responses that you know, people wanted to define your use cases up front, which means you got to know who you're targeting, talk to them, find out what they need, and then go see if you can turn it into a product. So whole, wholeheartedly agree. Uh, Kevin, do you have any questions from the audience for us? Yeah, we've got some, some very thoughtful uh, contributions here. One I want to uh, highlight, which is let's talk about data mesh and maybe drill in a little bit. Um, the data mesh is defined, as we know, by Zamak Pagani, includes data products. It also includes sort of a shared governance framework, a, a data sharing platform. And I think that the data product is one pillar, one of the several. And perhaps you could talk about other aspects of the data mesh, where and how they apply to this discussion. Well, I mean, I'll start because I think We'll give data mesh some credit for kind of kicking off this whole data product mania, if you can call that. <laughs> I'm not quite sure it's mania, but there's a lot of interest, obviously, in, in, in data products. Uh, and it's a good thing, because as I argued, and as our other panelists argued, there's a lot of value in them in terms of delivering trustworthy, reusable components that can be shared across organizational boundaries. The one thing that the data mesh methodology from Shamak missed was you got all these business domains that are highly autonomous building their own products. How do you share them? So right in the middle of all the domains was the missing piece, which is the data market, really. And I know companies that are long down the path of data products have built that themselves. They've built both local catalogs of products and then uh, an enterprise data mart that kind of taps into all those local yeah. data marts. And that's kind of what I showed in the, the kind of the reference product organization architecture. So I, I agree with a whole lot more of what Zamak has, has said than I disagree with. But um, so I certainly agree with data products. I agree with pushing ownership as close to the source as possible. I think she's onto something there because we do see data down through these pipelines get errors that nobody knows where they came from. I also think that, you know, her, the essence of what she's talking about, which is, you know, kind of data is distributed. That's really important, right? So, and I think Anthony also talked about it. You know, we see the big cloud vendors all pushing to, I'm going to put all your stuff in Snowflake or put all your stuff in, you know, whatever, right? Um, 
it's like a sheep in new clothing, right? They're still trying to put the data in a central place and it isn't going to happen. I was on the phone or on a call with this CDAO of a big giant uh, healthcare company recently, 53 data platforms. You know, I, I, my kids are going to be retired before all those 53 platforms are in the same place, right? So you need a layer that sits above it. I totally buy that. You need uh, ownership as close to the source as you can get it. I buy that. You need the governance model. I'm not sure with some of the technical stuff that she's indicated, because frankly, I think that those data processing platforms, whether it's Snowflake or Redshift or BigQuery or even NetEaser or Hive, they actually do a great job of processing data, you know, and you're not going to outdo them. So I think you need a thin layer on top. I mean, that's certainly how our, our product is built. Uh, that provides that, I don't think you have to, you know, come up with a completely different technical architecture. That's my take. Yeah, I definitely would agree. This whole data mesh thing is not new. We've been talking about it since the 90s. So, you know, and there's been various iterations. I think the mistake in the analysis is to not focus on the quality of the output from the mesh, if I can say it that way. Uh, so just building distributed queries, to Rick's point about the technology, I mean, it's an interesting technical problem. It doesn't actually solve a business user challenge, which is how can I get a view of my customers that cuts across all these systems? And simply aggregating all that data and saying, well, guess what? You have you know five instances of IBM when we know that there's only one version of IBM is, I mean, maybe an interesting technical challenge, but it doesn't solve the business user problem. And so getting back to thinking about what problem am I trying to solve? I want to get a single view of my customer. Okay, great. Is that a distributed query problem, a la mesh? Or is it a quality problem that I don't really understand uh, how these systems, in my example, link the customers together? I argue it's much more the second problem versus the first. We've had ways of doing distributed queries for 25, 30 years. Yeah, we, we talked about the mesh and fabric at the last tech event in August. And, and my response to all of these architecture discussions is that I agree wholeheartedly with everyone, <laughs> which means the real solution is federated or hybrid, like I presented in my keynote, is that you need both central and distributed capabilities, and they need to work together to make, you know, to get the best of both worlds and, and n none of the downsides of either. So uh, we need distributed processing, especially in companies that have had a lot of M&A. Uh, you need domains that are empowered to create their own products, but you also need strong central governance and a strong central data platform and a song, strong central data team that sets standards that get automatically enforced at the point of product creation in the domains. Anyway, I, I'll get on a soapbox if I say more. So let me turn it back to Kevin, see what other questions there are in the few minutes we have left. Yeah, that's great. I, th I think there's a, there's a good question, which I think Anthony is, is, and, and others have addressed, the notion of um, people being the first mile or the last mile. Anthony talked about starting more on the consumption side than the production side, I think in part to address some of the people elements. Uh, other thoughts on how to address the people dynamic here? Folks are interested in hearing about that. I would just say, you know, start by recognizing that, that you know, I think Anthony said water is going to find its own way. I don't remember how you said that, right? But I totally life, agree. life will find a way. From Jurassic yeah, Park. yeah. It, uh, uh, so if you try to control all your data centrally, you know, somebody at the edge is going to have a question. If you don't answer it, they're going to get the data on their own, hook or crook, and do something yes. with it. So... I think the critical thing to me, to the people, is you have to recognize that we've got a world of empowered people at the edge who need to use data in their world. And we cannot think of ourselves as a data team and then a bunch of consumers. Because those people at the edge, they're creators and they're consumers. And we need an environment that brings them into the process. And I think that that's critical to this success. In that same spirit, uh, not thinking, as a data team, we tend to spend time and energy with other people on the data team. I would encourage people to spend time and energy 
with people not on the data team. <laughs> uh, and you know, you, I would say the same thing to any product development organization. Don't spend time with developers, spend time with your users or customers. Um, and you're much more likely to learn something. Yeah. I mean, you know, the example I used of, you know, 6,000 data analysts, you know, and 200 data engineers. So are those data engineers going to produce everything that those 6,000 people, they, they have zero chance of doing that. So if we don't empower the people at the edge to both be creators and consumers, we're in trouble. But if we do empower them and we don't govern their work and create it in reusable ways, you know, then we're in trouble too, right? So, you know, we went from ETL, we built everything up front to ELT, and now we can put the transformations downstream. But what are you going to do to say which of those transformations, who built them, what's useful? Uh, that's this kind of bottoms up empowerment process that, you know, that I advocate. So it's interesting, Rick, you talk about empowerment at the edge, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree. And you also said, well, if we don't govern that, the implication is you, you have chaos, and, and that's also true. So what I'm seeing in data mesh implementations or distributed implementations is that companies are using, the data teams are using tools like Tamer uh, and data observability tools to actually certify the products that are getting built, that they meet data quality and consistency rules uh, so that what gets built gets delivered. Uh, so I'm wondering if that might be kind of a fundamental way you guys can partner as companies. Yeah, um, certainly when it comes to the joining aspect and the master data bit, I think that's true. I mean, to me, uh, this stuff has happened at the edge, whether they like it or not. We can, you know, put our head down and pretend it's not happening, but there's God knows how many Excel spreadsheets out there uh, where somebody's pulled some data. Um, so they're going to do it. Now, how do we make sure that they're doing things in the right way is we have to make it easy for them to reuse uh, certified logic and to publish that, right? If the tool where you go get that logic is different than the tool where you're managing it, you know, you got this swivel seat. I think that's kind of a problem. So what we've done is we said, look, we're going to make that catalog directly accessible. We're going to make the publishing process right part of how those end users use data. And, uh, you know, then it's going to build up from there, and, you know, kind of, and as I said earlier, look, open source software has worked, right? People can do this, uh, but data streams have not yet really embraced this idea of distributed uh, creation. And those edge people, they're not users. We should stop calling them users. They're creators as much as they are consumers. And uh, that needs to be part of our world. So, Kevin, we probably have time for one more question. Yeah. We've got a bunch here. So which one do you want to ask? Well, I actually want to ask one that I, I probably wrote down from a prior session and was maybe repeated here, which I thought was great, which is how do you set up a program, an economic value program to assess the revenue and the profit potential of what you're doing with these data products? Maybe you guys could double click on that. I would think about assessing the value as the, so it, there could be hundreds of sources and then there's one output, uh, lack of a better term, table uh, that's consolidating and rationalizing all of those sources. The unit of measure that I think is relevant is, the, is that consumption endpoint, is that finalized uh, table. Or to say it a slightly different way, how much time and energy it takes to, to create it is not the relevant metric. The relevant metric is the value of that table that comes out the other end. And so yeah. the way I would think about building a business case is to say, I have requests to build 50 tables <laughs> or 50 endpoint consumption uh, analyses. What's the, at a high level, what's the value of each one? So, you know, looking at the, you know, total number of cleaning products we used for desk services, probably not super high value. A 360 view of my customer, so I can cross sell and upsell, you know, that's that's high value, right? So you, you might think about ranking them on that metric. Yeah. But starting with these endpoint tables, not the uh, myriad of sources you're going to need to rationalize to get to those endpoint sources, which is what I think most data teams do. Like, well, that's going to take 
uh, 72 hours, therefore it's really expensive. No, 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 like, or that's gonna, I'm gonna require a thousand sources. So that's really expensive. No, no, no. What's I the value? It, I think that the, I agree with Anthony, the value is downstream, right? So the requesters of the business, you know, of the data products or the users are gonna establish the value that they're creating in the business. And they, it has to go come from there. The cost associated with it is, okay, processing costs. You can measure the processing cost of any, you know, specific data stream if you need to. Uh, and the, you know, the cost of building the data products becomes a question of the, you know, of the teams, et cetera, and just managing that cost. But if you're aligned with the business teams, the value that they're after, and if they can indicate the value from what they're doing, then that's how you build a process of measuring the value of, of what you do. And it, you don't, you know, if you build a data product for somebody and they don't use it, back to Anthony's point, if it isn't consumed, you've got a problem. And I loved, you know, Michael's earlier point, like actually retiring them. And as you said, Wayne, a lot of people yeah. don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that can also it lend itself to a certain amount of automation, right? That looking at usage. Uh, yeah, you and, can, there's you know, a trick there. You can take the product down and see if anyone complains. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, like that, that's a, that's a quick measure, right? If, if you get hate mail instantly, well, that's a high value data product. If no one notices for six months. There's your answer. So I've known some companies that are actually very militant about not building anything, not using the resources of any data and analytics team to build something unless it has a quantifiable value associated with it. Now that's pretty militant, as I said, to have a quantifiable ROI. I've seen companies that also have kind of a subjective scale uh, that they associate with output or products. I think whatever the case is beyond what the, the ken of what most data teams are capable of doing. So in those instances, if you really want to define the value, you need to team up with your financial department. Um, because one, you're not going to have any credibility as data professionals putting a value on something that you create. And you need an outside objective source who's got the financial skills to do that. Sure. So the, the, the finance team is perhaps the arbiter, the business team or the users are the ones who can indicate value, right? Exactly. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's not that hard, right. really. I mean, it takes some it's process. Hard, but you do need to make a point of doing it and reserve time and space to do it and get the people in the same room to hash it out. But anyway, I think we've exceeded our allotted time. So we're going to turn this back over to Kevin to close us down and talk about our next session. And thank hey, you, Kevin. Wayne, for having me. Well, likewise. <laughs> Rick, Anthony, great stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, great discussion. We're gonna take, we'll get into the next session. Wayne will walk through key takeaways. So yeah, and thanks, Rick here. and Anthony, for participating. Uh, your insights were incredibly valuable, uh, as well as the insights that your customers provided too. So thank you. Okay, I've taken some notes here, and I'm going to share what what uh, I think are some good key takeaways. Great discussion. I'll say as a quick aside, I'm, I'm reading a book right now that's a history of precision engineering, and it looks at, starting in the late 1700s, how people who are able to, with a real precise, standardized way, start to create interchangeable manufacturing parts, create the economic revolution that took place in the 1800s. And I think there's actually a similar opportunity here, maybe not the same scale. If you can have these interchangeable data products, um, you can really unleash a lot of consumption and innovation across uh, corporate America and across uh, global 1,000 companies. So there's a lot of opportunity here. So some of the takeaways, data products are more than data assets. Um, I think Wayne's made a great case from this and some of these first notes are from his keynote. Some of the key attributes, they're reusable, they're shared, continuously funded. You've got target users and rigorous, rigorous data governance. They might be data sets, they might be code, fully baked applications, the answer is yes to all that. It really needs a data market, such as a catalog of data products. And this is a way that you can unlock the value with frictionless data sharing. I thought Wayne did a great job articulating what we mean by data product platform. You'll have a product studio, you'll store, you'll have this repository of data products. It'll sip on top of a data fabric in terms of infrastructure 
and you need the ability to build, buy, mix, or match data products. That gets to a lot of the interchangeability and reusability that was a consistent theme throughout this. And you know, in terms of my economic example from the 1700s, unleashes a lot of uh, productivity gains over time. A lot of data products will be virtual. That makes perfect sense. You can have pointers to different data elements that are stored in uh, different parts of a distributed architecture. That's a reality of today's world. Many enterprises are hybrid and or multi-cloud. There are different segments, market segments that are getting into this space, data commerce, data integration companies, catalogs, analytics platforms, and master data management. We talked about master data management. They're all moving into the data product, product platform space. The role of the data product manager is part product manager, part owner, part marketer. And the data product organization can be centralized or decentralized. There are pros and cons to each. So data product governance requires careful organizational structures and workflows. You need a review process and approval process, oversight and standards. And Wayne, I thought you did a good job kind of walking through the, the workflows that, that are involved there. Yeah, you know, to, to, to Anthony's point that in response to a question we had from the audience, isn't this just product management applied to data products? And yes, it's what Anthony and, and Rick do every day because they're essentially running product organizations. Just now we're bringing this into the world of data. Very true. So I thought Mike Ross gave great presentation. I love how he talked about, and Wayne, you prompt him on this, testable, usable, and lovable. It's a great and important adjective that is not used enough in the context of, of data. And I, I like how he talked about how some of these data pro man product managers have specific product management experience. Um, so they understand the discipline of product management, now they're applying it to the domain of data. This is paired with a product council, which has senior executives throughout the company, and they're helping go to the consumption side and actually drive conversations with outside users. Wayne, you talked about the journey from query to Excel file to application that's continuously used. That's a not a bad maturity life cycle for, um, for a data product. And what's interesting about Mike, and we, we talked about it in the wrap up there as well, they've even started to retire one or more data products, which is a critical step. We all know that you have to be willing to um, cut the cord yeah. or you just have a lot of technical debt piling up. Yeah, the interesting about Mike Ross's case study is that it's, you know, from an analytics perspective, it's really not very sophisticated. In fact, some people might look their nose down the fact that they're just generating Excel reports. But it just goes to show you, you know, you don't have that need the fanciest technology to have real business impact, which I think he made a good case that they're having, right? That these products that they're generating are actually of high value to the organization um, because their product council reviews them and prioritize which ones to do. They're leveraging their resources effectively and they're actually being used to make real product decisions. So even though it's Excel-based reports, hey, it's working. And we all know that our industry is rife with uh, over-engineered, unusable or unused products. So agree completely. I also talked about, I, I liked how, I think it was Mike, was talking about how you could have data products that have been overlooked in the business. Um, and if you can unearth that, actually, no, this was in recall section. There are, there are gems of wisdom to be had. And, and if you can find those and shine a bright light, you can give a lot of value to the data consumers. Hey, Kevin, before you go on, I'd like to encourage yeah. our uh, audience to send in their questions or comments. Uh, you guys are part of this wrap up as well, and we'll bring them in. Yeah, that'd be great. And Wayne, if you can, that'd be great. I, I can't see um, their comments right now, but we'd love to uh, have that contributed. So with Anupam, takeaways I had was that 
MDM is not a bad place to start. You can have data products that derive from these MDM golden records. Anupam talked about some of the barriers as well. High data volumes, determining who owns these products, and then cross-functional processes for standardizing. None of those are surprising, but it did sort of underscore something that Anthony talked about as well, which is that the data engineers can't keep up. Data teams can't keep up. That's certainly a theme we see in all disciplines of data management right now. We hope AI, generative AI, and other things can improve productivity. Well, it was so interesting. We, we really didn't plan it, as I said, to have Tamer and Cogenity as sponsors of the event, but they're both kind of at that same level uh, delivering these foundational data products that you need to build any other data product. Maybe this is the first of many events on data products, so we're covering the foundational stuff today. But it will be interesting to see if those two can actually come together and do some kind of a, a formal linkage between the two products, right? Maybe it's like Cogenity and resells or embeds Tamer to enable their customers to generate those golden records that they can associate with their SQL code, right? And we'll see if we can uh, play midway for future uh, sponsors yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting plot twist for uh, for these sessions for the audience. It's good. So Rick, great session and agree completely with what he's talking about with uh, data leaders citing serious issues with data quality and re reusability. That echoes again and again what we've seen anecdotally and with surveys. And it's no surprise that this is one of the contributors to the extensive turnover among chief data and analytics officers. Randy Bean and others talked about that at the CDO IQ event in Boston uh, earlier this year. So I like these four principles and I won't list each of them or go into too much detail. I, I will say that the notion of quality granular data that might otherwise be overlooked, I really liked how Rick highlighted that. And the, the notion of granular data is important. I talked about precision engineering as a sort of a model to apply to this. The more you can be very, very specific and accurate and repeatable with these modular building blocks that we're calling data products, the better, because you need to reduce misuse and you need to minimize risk of mishandling those that stuff. So quality granular data yeah. sets are critical. Data products, right? Granular data right. products. I mean. yeah. So, you know, Rick is all about empowering the power user. Basically, Cogenity sells SQL tools or tools that enable power users to generate SQL much more efficiently and effectively. And within the last year or two, he's released this, I forgot what he called, analytical repository. So bullet number four here, to me, is the most important because I've seen companies, they empower their power users and then all chaos breaks loose because they're just building whatever and nothing adds up and everything conflicts and blah, blah, blah. But if you can basically take their output, review it, select the ones you want to standardize your organization on, store it in a repository, and then say, if you're going to use that calculation, you have to use the standard one in the repository, which is what foster collaboration and reuse is all about then you get the best of both worlds. You get empowerment and standardization. That's ultimately what you want. That's governed self-service at its best. Absolutely. All right, so we go to the, the final slide here. Anthony, uh, very interesting session. Some of the key attributes that he's defining for data products are ready for consumption, high quality, trustworthy, accessible, and very much focused on helping solve business problems, which gets to a point he and others made of starting at the consumption side, starting at the, the business value side in terms of determining what it is you want to build and manage. It's best if these are clean, standardized, have many attributes. He talked about consistent customer views. Agree with the notion, as I said before, that data teams can't keep up. And ideally, this, this applies to a lot of situations. AI, we hope, can unlock and break this traditional trade-off of either throwing a lot of people at a problem, which doesn't scale in terms of cost, or just locking down future changes. If you can have data sets that iterate, but in a governed way with the assistance of AI, 
you can ideally support scalability, innovation, but maintain consistency and governance. Yeah, so Tamer has been out there for a while and it's yeah. always played in the entity resolution marketplace, right? And it was the first one really to bring AI to bear on this. So, which means that you can throw at huge volumes of data from multiple systems and it's AI will churn through them all and basically identify like records, AKA duplicates and standard, and it actually doesn't, manipulate those records. It just says, hey, this record from system A, that record from system B, this other record from system C, they're all the same person or the same company or the same product, right? So we'll create a link or a, a, an ID that enables, that links them all. And then you can do what you want with that, right? And they also do create a golden record out of that. So they, they create a registry of related records and then through a, a manual process, people will then decide which of the fields in each of those records they want to keep and put into a golden record. So that entity resolution has been out there for a while. Their use of AI has been out there for a while. But what's interesting is that they've recognized that, you know, you can't really build data products without this. I think he's right. And everything that you build requires this clean, consistent master data or reference data. Um, so any calculations that Rick's customers will do require this, right? So you can't really start until you solve this problem. So I hadn't thought about, you know, this type of tool being so fundamental to data products, but I think Anthony has uh, persuaded me that they are. I'd love to hear what other people think too. I loved Anthony's comment that he's never met anyone who's uh, excited to be on an MDM team, but perhaps they should because <laughs> it's an enabler of everything that comes after. It's like brushing your teeth. You really know you need to do it. You don't particularly want to, but the, uh, you get, the state. You got you to add that to this list here because uh, yeah, that, that, that was a classic comment and, it, and it's so true and, <laughs> and goes to the state of MDM today. It just, we just need it to be more lightweight and Maybe not try to boil the ocean. And so tools like this are a good way to get something done fast for a specific project, right? Let's master the data related to this project and, and go from there. You know, you don't have to create this huge meta model of master data and do yeah. bi-directional synchronization, you know, <laughs> yeah, which the takes years. Is critical. Yeah. Great. So expert panel, we talked about some of the themes here, but also had some additional stuff and Wayne, you might have more data governance is not purely centralized or top down. Uh, Rick talked about that. And I think everyone agreed that there's a need to have, um, well, you know, Wayne, you've, you've written a lot about govern self-service and I think that model can apply here in the sense that you want to empower edge use cases, edge consumption and so forth while still maintaining some level of, uh, governance. There was a theme, of course, of talking about consumption rather than production. And we talked about data mesh and the, the pillars there, in addition to data products that matter, data product ownership uh, matters and, uh, and putting that as close to the source as possible, Rick said, is a fundamental element of the data mesh from Samoktagani that applies here. And everybody got on their soapbox for that one. I think uh, the data mesh brings out the, uh, the real passion in people. It invokes religious feelings on, on all sides. And Wayne, I think that uh, you talked about the federated model and um, you need central elements as well as distributed. I simplified that a little bit here. Are there other points you want to make about the notion of, of having a federated approach? Well, yeah, I mean, you see it all over the place. No, no matter what you're trying to organize, you know, you can't completely centralize it and you can't completely decentralize it because you run into problems when you go too far in one direction, right or left, you, you're going to run into huge problems. And when you run into those problems, the natural reaction, human reaction is to say, oh, let's get away from that. And so we're going to go the other direction. So you bumped into the problems with the, you know, going down the right side and then like, we're going to go all the way to the left and we'll bump into those problems. So a federated model says, don't swing back and forth. 
between extremes, it's kind of like our political situation today, <laughs> you know, it's either one or the other. What yeah. we really need is both at the same time that are aligned in cooperating and working things out. And it's funny, when you actually take those opposites and you pull them together, which is creates a lot of tension, that's what generates innovative solutions. And I see that organizationally, I see that technically in terms of architectures, and I think I even see that politically, if you want to get real esoteric about things. I agree, I agree completely. And so the final point here was the question posed by an apt user, which is what's the program and metric to evaluate the, the value of these data products, the economic potential of them? And uh, we talked about starting downstream, the output and what the consumer is going to do with it certainly fits with a familiar theme of technology, which is to remind ourselves against our engineering impulses to start with business problems to solve, business yeah. use cases to work back from there. You know, I probably should have mentioned there's a new book out by a good friend, uh, Barbara Wixom, called Data is Everybody's Business. Can we see that? Wait. Oh, okay. And it's kind of all about how to ascertain the value of data, very practical way. So it's data is everybody's business, the fundamentals of data monetization. And by that, she means not actually selling data necessarily. It means all data has value and you just have to uh, deliver that and calculate it. So highly recommend That's it. Great. Yeah. That's great. And it, it brings to mind the, um, blog that our own Jay Piscinari just published about the need for data citizenship, which is that with another political analogy, just as you need informed voters in a democratic system, you need informed people to be either requesting data or using it. And so there's a real need for data literacy. So it is everyone's business. And there's also, I think, a certain responsibility for people to be uh, smart consumers, smart informed consumers data. So Wayne, what other things did I miss here? I thought it was a great discussion. I certainly learned a lot. Oh, you, you got, you captured quite a bit there, Kevin. So uh, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head other than um, six months, we expect those two companies to announce a partnership of some sort. So. Very good. Sounds like we can wrap up at this point. Wrap up the wrap up. Yeah, fair enough. So thank you, Kevin, for moderating. And thanks everyone in the audience for listening and contributing questions and comments. We'll be back when, Kevin, for your gig? We will be back March. We're going to have a couple notes here. So next week, we'll send out an event summary report. It'll have a summary of the event, links to videos and slides and our key takeaways. I know from LinkedIn, there are some folks who, like me, couldn't make a live event. As often the case, I'm often reviewing the videos for these things over the weekends. Um, next month, we're going to send you, uh, Wayne's going to send you a market landscape report on how to create, govern, and manage data products. So these are great. You can see some samples of what we've done in the past. They're rich, digital, multimedia reports. They've got videos, graphics, text from the event, and it's a great multimedia immersive experience. So while you're there, you can browse our digital reports from other events including data governance, data observability, data sharing in marketplaces, modern data pipelines, catalogs. We've got quite a repository there. And the final point here is that we've got a CDO tech event in March on driving data management and analytics with generative AI. So this is driving data management and analytics with generative AI, practices and products you need to know. I'll be uh, delivering the keynote. Very excited about this. It'll be held on March 21st. So I hope you all can join us. And I think that's it. Okay. It'll be great suspense. There we go. Yeah. yeah and here was the market landscape report and uh, event summary report you'll get next week. Market landscape report will take about a month. So fantastic. All, all right. right. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you in three months. <laughs>